Hey, welcome to the National Board of Forensic Evaluators webinar entitled DSM-5-TR, What Mental Health Professionals Should Know About the New Edition. But I'm very glad to be joining in with you all today and um, spending our Friday diving into this new edition of the DSM-5. This is always a popular topic for us anytime that uh, there's something new that comes out with the DSM. I remember when the DSM-5 came out in 2013, we had um, ridiculous attendance at webinars that we were presenting on the new edition then. And the DSM-5-TR is kind of really different um, in terms of what's new compared to what changed from the DSM-4-TR to the DSM-5. So it's kind of a different ball game today. But um, I'm glad you're here and hopefully we'll be able to uh, have you walking away today feeling like you have a good understanding of what's new with this new edition. Um. I'm just going to start by making sure that you all know about the National Board of Forensic Evaluators that we're doing this webinar through. Uh, we are a national not-for-profit organization, and we're endorsed by the American Mental Health Counselors Association and several state associations in Florida, Georgia, and West Virginia, and um, North Carolina, Louisiana, Utah, Washington, and, and so forth. And I know we have a good national group of you here today. Uh, we also provide, in addition to quality training for counselors that specialize in the forensic mental health arena, we also provide certification, uh, managing the Certified Forensic Mental Health Evaluator credential and two subspecialization credentials. So if you're interested in hearing more about our training events, our on-demand webinars, our certification workshops, feel free to visit us at nbfe.net. Oh. And if we get some questions that we do not have time to address today, Here's my email address. It's on the left-hand side there, aaron at nbfe.net. Shoot me an email. Sometimes it'll take me a little bit to get back with you if my inbox is a bit clogged, but I will respond to you if you send me an email with follow-up questions that we can't um, attend to today. Uh, I uh, am the executive director of the National Board of Forensic Evaluators, and I do some work in my private practice as well and some instruction work for the University of South Florida. And I'm very involved with the uh, associations, the American Mental Health Counselors Association and the Florida Mental Health Counselors Association. I'm here in the Tampa Bay area of Florida. Okay, so handouts. Everybody always wants to know about handouts, right? Um, everything that you see on the slides, you will have access to in your handouts. And to access those handouts, here's your link. That is where you can get not only the slides that you'll see today, but all of the hyperlinks built into the slides now, what are we going to cover today? We're going to begin with some just overview kind of information about the DSM-5-TR. And we're going to connect it to sort of the history of the DSM. I'm kind of, I like to be a big picture guy sometimes and see, kind of understand why are things happening and, and why have they moved in a certain direction over time? And what are we trying to do here? What's the big picture, the big trend? The second thing that we'll do is we'll get into the disorder-related updates. and. Frankly speaking, a lot of those are going to be very boring. There are a lot of what I would call semantic uh, changes. It's all about we're going to change this word to that word because we like this word better kind of stuff. Some of it, though, represents something very big in terms of what the APA is trying to do in this new edition and how that fits into the evolving kind of sociocultural landscape that we see in our country and maybe to some degree in the world. Uh, then after we've covered many of those updates, we're gonna move into a new disorder that's called prolonged grief disorder. It is you know, the only new mental disorder that you will actually see in the DSM-5-TR. And then after we cover that condition, we'll move, move into some of the changes in section three of the DSM-5-TR. And if we have time for it, I'd like to poke around in the world of assessments that we see that the APA has provided us in the DSM-5, um, some of which have been updated in the DSM-5-TR and kind of introduce you to some of those tools because I think some of them are very useful in your clinical practice. And then finally, we'll get to our questions and answers at the end for whatever remaining time we have and let you all interact and see what you would like to ask about DSM-5-TR. Not that I'll necessarily have the answers for you, um, but uh, we'll give it a shot. I just checked the chat 
checkbox here real quick. Okay, looks like we're good. All right. So hopefully this is what you came here for today because this is what we have for you today. And now we're gonna get into our first polling question. And it really looks like the majority of you are counselors, 72%. But we've got some marriage and family therapists and some psychologists and some social workers with us today as well. So welcome everyone. Uh, looks like most of you are not a CFMHE or an applicant, but about half of, well, actually it's about half and half. Half of you are either pursuing the credential or have it, or you're, you are doing neither right now. Looks like uh, the largest, the most popular answer was I have no idea what's in it, but um, some of you have a little knowledge and maybe about a third of you have a moderate amount of knowledge. So that's good. Uh, and, and we have somebody who's very knowledgeable, at least, at least somebody who, maybe a couple people who are, um, but to explain the, the TR part of this, what TR meant with the DSM-4 TR was that the actual diagnostic criteria in the DSM-4 TR were the same as they were in the DSM-4. So if you were a person who bought the DSM-4 and you said, all I care about is the diagnostic criteria, then you may not have seen any need to buy a DSM-4 TR. Um, because the only thing that was different than the DSM-4 TR was things like the statistical information that you see in the DSM about prevalence rates and um, some of those sorts of things, some information on the course of different conditions had been changed. And all of that information can be very useful for you depending on the setting you work in. But if you are sort of your frontline busy therapist that the only thing that you care about is a diagnostic criteria, you might not have found any need to get a DSM-4 TR. Of course, with the DSM-5, that was not true because there were new conditions in the DSM-5, but the DSM-5 TR is a little bit different than the DSM-4 TR because they did add one new disorder and they changed the text in some of the diagnostic criteria for existing disorders, as well as fixing some kind of errors and inconsistencies and updating language um, in some ways that they thought were very relevant. And we'll get into the meat and potatoes of what all that was in just a moment. Let's also kind of look at the overall picture here for a moment. We get our first edition of the DSM in 1952. And it is so tiny that on this photo on the left-hand side, um, you can barely see that sliver of a pamphlet looking thing at the very top, uh, two, two books above the DSM-3. Um, so it's extremely skinny and there were 106 diagnoses and some of the criticisms of the original DSM and the DSM-2 were that they were really just very brief descriptions of disorders and what they're supposed to be about. They did not include actual diagnostic criteria. They didn't have information on prevalence rates and statistics and those sorts of things. It was very bare bones, like just a brief description of what a disorder might be. And then um, in 1968, as you can see, um, that's where you get into this kind of odd binder on top of DSM-3 there on the left-hand side. And that is um, the, the DSM-2, which had nine uh, or 185 diagnoses. So you can see quite an expansion of diagnoses in that 16-year um, period between 52 and 68. But we still had very brief descriptions of things in comparison to what we have today. The big revolution was in 1980 with the DSM-3. And as you can see there, we have another very large increase in the number of diagnoses starting with the DSM-3. And you can also see on the left-hand side that that book was pretty thick compared to the DSM-1 and 2. So here we not only have um, some good statistical information and information about course and uh, prevalence rates and those sorts of things. But we get into very specific diagnostic criteria. So with the DSM-3, we start getting more scientific, more specific, and we also introduce more of a research uh, informed process for diagnosis compared to what we saw in the original two versions of the DSM. So essentially 1980 is like the introduction of the more contemporary medical model in the diagnostic system. And then the DSM-3 revision in 1987 had 292 diagnoses. We move on to the DSM-4 where we only add another five 
overall in 94. And we didn't add any new diagnoses in the DSM-4 TR, as we mentioned earlier. We got a whole one more diagnosis than we had in the DSM-4 TR and DSM-5. Um, that's a little complicated because some things, some different diagnoses were collapsed into the same diagnosis. Because in the DSM-5, one of the big paradigm shifts then was using more of like a spectrum model and, um, and then having variations within that spectrum. So for example, that's when we get autism spectrum disorder and when we get uh, the schizophrenia spectrum and we also get um, like, for example, substance abuse and substance dependence diagnoses were collapsed together into one substance use disorder ranging in severity from mild to severe. So think spectrum when you think DSM-5 and that of course continues with the DSM-5-TR where we add just one new disorder and then revise um, not only update all the statistics um, from what we saw in the DSM-5 so that we have more current research in the different sections of the DSM-5-TR, but we've also updated some of the language in the diagnostic criteria itself for existing disorders to be clearer and to deal with some sort of diagnostic discrepancies and things. So that's the kind of overview of where we've been headed all this time and where we are now where we are now. This new edition actually started being revised in the spring of 2019, and um, it got published in March 2022. And I think I failed to mention this, but um, I know that there was work being done long before 2019 that was kind of preliminary work that was involved in the current um, revision, but um, I guess I don't have it on this slide but there were over 200 multidisciplinary subject matter experts. And although the APA does talk about this being a multidisciplinary team, and it's true that it's not just a group of psychiatrists, still, when you kind of look at the numbers, 64% psychiatrists, 30% psychologists, and 6% other. So that other would be like counselors and social workers and marriage and family therapists and so on, I believe. I think they even had some anthropologist or something along those lines that was involved. So, um, so it is still predominantly uh, created and revised and overseen by psychiatrists. There are three different overlapping groups that are involved in the process. The DSM-5 task force, which created the DSM-5, of course, it was published in 2013 the DSM Steering Committee, and then the Revision Subcommittee. There are 20 disorder review groups, each headed by a section editor. And the literature reviews in this new edition cover the past 10 years. So remember, one of the primary, really the primary focus of the DSM 5TR was to update the text and including some of the information on prevalence and statistics rates and that sort of thing. Uh, so that literature has been updated to cover just the past 10 years. Because, you know, something that was published in 2013, those rates are going to be pretty outdated at this point. Um, we also had four cross-cutting review groups, culture, sex and gender, suicide, and forensics. So these groups, they reviewed basically a span of the text for, to look at things that could be impacted by their areas of expertise. And there was an ethno-racial equity and inclusion work group. We're going to see one of their members uh, talk a little bit about what that group did in just a moment here. But one of the things that they worked on was updating some of the language in the DSM-5-TR um, as it relates to ethno-racial equity and inclusion. And as we mentioned before, there's only one new disorder in the DSM-5-TR but criteria sets were revised for 70 different disorders. And you know, some of those may make a difference in terms of the diagnosis that you end up concluding that a client meets. The revisions were approved by the APA Board of Trustees. Uh, they posted the revisions for public feedback. They um, considered or factored in some of the feedback that they got from the public. And in the DSM-5, I think we see this on the next slide, actually. In the DSM-5, which you see here on the left, and on the right, you see the ICD-10, there's this kind of code or this myth that the codes that we see in the DSM 
are DSM codes, but they're really not. Every code that you see in the DSM comes from the International Classification of Diseases, the ICD. And for the most part, the codes that you see in the DSM are going to come specifically from the ICD uh, of mental and behavioral disorders. And in the DSM-5, what you saw next to every condition was a numeric number, in this case for generalized anxiety disorder, 300.02, and then you saw an alphanumeric F41.1. So that 300.02 was from the ICD-9, and then in parentheses, we had our F41.1. That was the code from the ICD-10, which we were, all, we were all supposed to have transitioned to in October 2015. So since the DSM, now the DSM-5 came out in 2013. So at that point, you kind of needed both codes. You needed the ICD-9 code and the ICD-10 code. But with the DSM-5-TR, um, having just been published last month, you don't need the ICD-9 code anymore because no one's using those. So you'll see they dropped all of those ICD-9 codes and we only have the ICD-10 codes listed in the DSM-5-TR. Okay, so that gives us our great segue into the efforts made in the DSM-5-TR to attention to culture, racism, and discrimination. So, as we mentioned before, there was this cross-cutting review committee on cultural issues, 19 US and international based experts in psychiatry, psychology, and anthropology. And then the ethno-racial equity and inclusion work group, which consists of 10 mental health practitioners from diverse ethnic and racialized backgrounds with their own expertise in practices that can reduce disparity, um, especially as it relates to the terminology that we see in the DSM. So what are some of the things that they did in the new edition then, um, thanks to the work of these work groups? Terms race and racial have been replaced by the term racialized. And their rationale for this change is that the concept race or the term race itself obviously means different things to different people. And what it doesn't seem to mean in society is strictly some kind of biological difference between different groups of people. And it seems to be a socially constructed concept that involves not just um, things like physical characteristics, for example, or color, but many other different things, including culture. So that's their thinking for using the word racialized instead of race or racial. The term ethno-racial was used to denote the different categories that we see in the US Census Bureau, such as Hispanic, white, and African-American, because these words combine ethnic and racial, racialized identifiers. Like take Hispanic, for example. Somebody could identify as being Hispanic and they could have very dark colored skin. They could have very light colored skin. They could come from Europe. They could come from Latin America. Um, and they can have very different cultures. Uh, and it is more an ethno-racial category. Um, I'm used to thinking of, for maybe the older model, that like white and uh, black, for example, are races, and that Hispanic and non-Hispanic are an ethnicity label. But this is a broader construct, ethno-racial, because of the complexity of these terms. The terms minority and non-white have been avoided. And the reason is that they think that those words still sort of feed a narrative that there's a majority group that is maybe in power and that everyone else is sort of like secondary to them. So for example, there's white and then there's everybody else, all the non-white individuals. And so not only did it seem to them like that sort of denotes some kind of a, an implicit hierarchy of some kind. But in addition, it's becoming less and less true that white people are um, the majority. Um, the ratios of different colors of skin, for example, have been shifting substantially in the United States. The term Latinx 
has been used to replace the terms Latino and Latina. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about that and some of the controversies related to that in just a moment. So we'll come back to it. The word Caucasian um, has been replaced with the phrase non-Latinx white. And that's because I know for some people, Caucasian has been very confusing to them because it sort of implies it coming from Asia or something along those lines. Um, and also Caucasian became a confusing term in terms of what it's really supposed to mean. Is it people that come from Europe at some point? Is it people with white colored skin? What is it exactly? But um, non-Latinx white um, instead has been the phrase that they think is the most appropriate phrase to use at this point. Now, there are various points in the DSM where there's information provided on disparities and different rates of diagnosis of different mental disorders based on ethno-racial groups. That data was all updated whenever possible throughout the DSM. So you will get to have more updated data to draw from. Now, I mentioned we'll come back to the idea of the Latinx thing because this one's been actually quite controversial. Um, because when we examine inter polling data and survey data of Latin Americans, what we see is number one, most of them do not know the word Latinx. They don't recognize it or know what it means. And second, those who do don't tend to use it. Very few of them use it. And only about 2% of Hispanic Americans prefer the term Latinx. And half of Hispanic people actually find it offensive. And uh, so what you'll see is, for example, the two major uh, Spanish-speaking TV networks in the United States, Telemundo and Univision, they have opted for use of Latino instead of Latinx. They have sort of um, adopt, uh, decided not to adopt the term. And just as an example of uh, what some people who identify as Latin American think about this term, when I heard it, my first thought was that it wasn't Spanish, but that it was pretentious. Many Latinos like myself see the X as odd and off-putting because it doesn't follow the traditional structure of Spanish, making it awkward and difficult to pronounce because in Spanish, few words end with two consonants. And so an interesting counter argument has been made that Latinx is a term that seems to be used by more um, non-Hispanic white people than by Latin Americans themselves. And in that sense is sort of commandeering another culture's language, its own form of colonialization um, in the name of being more gender inclusive. So you got on one hand, people who think it's great to have a slot next term because it's non-binary. And in the Spanish language itself is definitely not non-binary. Uh, those of you who know Spanish, um, You'll know, for example, a dog is going to be a perro or a perra. An O if it's a male dog, an A if it's a female dog, there's not a perex. Um, and so the entire language is that way. And therefore, words like Latino and Latina are that way as well. And so Latinx seems to be a good word for people who identify as non-binary. They don't identify with either uh, masculine or feminine pronouns but they do identify as Latin American. But conversely, a lot of people prefer the term Hispanic, which is slightly different than the definition of Latino and Latina, but it's also not a you know, gender normative phrase um, in that sense. So there's a lot of debate about this and uh, the debate continues to rage on. I think it was kinda though, just my personal opinion, maybe, could be experienced as insulting that the APA decided to adopt this term to the majority of people who identify as Latin American. Um, but it's something to be aware of. And it's one reason why I've been kind of hesitant to use the phrase myself, though I see the rationale behind it. So um, hopefully just a little bit of background information helps you understand the complexity of some of the evolving uses of terminology. I mean, who knows, by the time we hit DSM-6, we might have a new word to use. Um, all kinds of possibilities here. I know some of you chimed in in the chat box and um, said things like, um, 
let's see, uh, these cultural identifiers are very specific to region from my understanding. Another comment was, I can speak for myself and my family members as a whole. We do not claim Latinx or use or any use of Latinx. We actually find it offensive. And um, thank you for pointing out the use of Latinx in an effort to be politically correct. If from another ethnicity, we may be unwittingly insulting if a person is not non-binary. And another comment, um, I went on a date once and used Latinx and the person remarked how much she appreciated it. I don't use it anymore though. I ask the person their preference. Another comment, I identify as black and African-American, but remember my great aunt refer um, applying to herself as colored. And if a person speaks Spanish, just like the English language forms of she, her, hers, or they, we can also use she, her, hers, and they. And then a final comment, uh, the use of Latinx is meant to be inclusive of non-binary people. I'm Latin and support inclusivity. And finally, I'm a Lat Latino myself and I feel offensive to use the term Latinx. So as you can see, even among our own attendees, um, attendees who identify as uh, Latin American, some people find it offensive and some people do not. And that seems to be the way it is. Although it does seem like polling data it, in, in general would show that um, the majority of Latin Americans uh, do not like the term very much. But that could change. That could be different five months from now, who knows? So let's dive in now to some of the disorder changes. We'll start off with a few changes that involve diagnoses for children. And we'll start with autism spectrum disorder. And I'm certainly not implying here that autism spectrum disorder does not, is not diagnosed in adults. Um, it certainly manifests in childhood, but um, criterion A phrase, as manifested by the following, was replaced with as manifested by all of the following to maintain a high diagnostic threshold. Um, what this is about is, as some of you are aware, there has been a surge in diagnoses of autism spectrum disorder. It seems like there's just a sort of cultural phenomenon right now where a lot of people think that they have autism, and some of them do, and some of them do not. And there's a concern about overdiagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, like we're seeing it too much in people and we're, we're getting too, um, we're not truly honoring the diagnostic threshold in the DSM. So they really wanted to clarify that when they say as manifested by the following, they mean as manifested by all of the following. Second, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder has been clarified to be diagnosable between the ages of six and 18. And for PTSD, there's a phrase, witnessing does not include events that are witnessed only in electronic media, television, movies, or children, and criterion A2 for children, uh, that phrase was removed because it's redundant, because A2 already notes that events occurring to others must be witnessed in person. So as you can see, like some, like something like this might not be a big change. It might not really affect anything in your diagnostic process. These might be a little bit more impactful. Attenuated psychosis syndrome, the phrase with relatively intact reality testing has been removed and the symptoms were, have been described more accurately. By the way, um, with any of these links, remember you can click on it and you can read more about the justification or the rationale for that change. We won't be able to go through all of them, all of the justifications today, but we can at least tell you about the change. Avoided restrictive food intake disorder. Criterion A text as manifested by persistent failure to meet appropriate nutritional and or energy needs has been eliminated to be consistent because A4 allowed criterion A to be met by marked interference with psychosocial functioning which does not require a failure to meet nutritional needs. And for our bipolar disorder severity specifiers, you know, mild, moderate, severe, uh, those specifiers only made sense if the most recent episode was depressive and not manic or hypomanic. So a new set of descriptors for severity have been added. And that would be if most recent episode is manic or hypomanic, um, then you get a different way of describing the severity. So you get severity, for the, if the most recent episode is depressive, and then you get severity markers for if the most recent episode is manic or hypomanic, which makes a lot of sense to me that they would have made that change. <laughs> All right, now I wanna point out, um, we did get um, a couple comments that'd be good to throw in. Um, here's one, as a therapist who works primarily with autistic youth and some adults within the autistic community, self-diagnosis is seen as valid. Also, some adults with ASD are anxious about this change. Specifically, those often missed by the criteria, women and POC, might have their diagnoses invalidated further, just something to consider. So 
Um, part of that makes a lot of sense to me. I'll be honest with you. I don't really, I don't think people should just diagnose themselves with disorders. I think that's why we have diagnostic criteria for disorders is so people can't just say, I have a thing and that we have, that words still mean things so that messages can be conveyed in a sensible way. But I do understand and appreciate the perspective that there are people sort of within a community because there is kind of a community that has evolved around a sort of identity of people who are on the spectrum and that within that community, they may view self-diagnosis as valid and accurate and um, that they don't need a mental health professional to diagnose them for their diagnosis to be valid. And um, then the other question is, I guess I, um, I would be interested in some more information about how for women and people of color, their diagnoses might be further invalidated by this change. I, I would love to hear some more about that if there's some additional information about it. And for John's question about uh, DSM-5 cross-cutting symptom tools, we're gonna come back to that because we will be covering that with the section three changes in a moment. So for delirium, phrasing reduced orientation of the environment has been replaced with accompanied by reduced awareness of the environment. And for functional neurological disorder, um, we used to call it conversion disorder in the DSM-5, and then we put in parentheses functional neurological symptom disorder. Now we're flipping the, um, the order. We're saying it is functional neurological symptom disorder, and we're putting conversion disorder in parentheses. Why? Well, anytime in the DSM, when you see one label and then another one in parentheses next to it, all that is intended to do is to make it easier for mental health clinicians to transition from using the phrase in parentheses that will become the new phrase in the future. Um, and then sometimes the, the word in the phrase then when it flips will help people to transition from that old phrase to the current phrase, uh, if that makes sense. So what I would expect is in the DSM-6, we will probably just see functional neurological symptom disorder. We will have no parentheses conversion disorder by that point. Gender dysphoria. The term desired gender has been replaced with experienced gender. Someone emailed me about this, and I think all this really means is the gender. Somebody asked me, well, what does experienced gender mean? And that means the gender that I experienced myself as. As one of the um, work group members was just describing, the word gender is thought of as being more of a social word. It is not a word that denotes biology. Sex denotes biology. So gender is more of a social construct. And um, whereas sex is a more of a biological construct. Um, think your chromosomal configuration, for example, with sex. The term cross-sex medical procedure has been replaced with gender-affirming medical procedure, and the same, therefore, with cross-sex hormone treatment that has been replaced with gender-affirming hormone treatment. Natal male, that term has been replaced with individual assigned male at birth, and therefore, natal female has also been replaced with individual assigned female at birth. And differences in sex development have now been noted as an alternate form for disorders of sex development. And I think what you see there is an attempt to sort of um, depathologize. Intellectual disorder, that phrase has been replaced with intellectual developmental disorder. This is to be consistent with the ICD-11, um, which I know we have not adopted in the United States yet. But, and also the criteria were clarified so that although it's true that one should not be bound narrowly to the 65 to 75 IQ score range, the diagnosis itself would not be appropriate for those with a substantially higher IQ score. So if you have somebody with a high uh, IQ score of 85, they probably should not be getting um, a diagnosis of intellectual development dis developmental disorder, for example. Uh, major depressive disorder, criterion D is changed from the occurrence of the major depressive episodes not better explained by schizoaffective disorder to at least one major depressive episode as not better explained by schizoaffective disorder and as not superimposed on schizophrenia. It has always been so confusing to people differentiating um, schizoaffective disorder from somebody that has, say, a, a psychotic disorder like schizophrenia and also have, meets criteria for maybe bipolar disorder separately, or whether we have a superimposed 
episode, it just gets really convoluted sometimes. Narcolepsy subtypes have been revised to be more consistent with, I think that's the International Classification of Sleep Disorders, the ICSD-3, and of course the ICD-11, the International Classification for Diseases, which recently has been adopted by some countries, but has not yet been adopted here in the US. Olf olfactory reference disorder has been replaced or replaced other specific obsessive compulsive and related disorder, comma, Jikoshu Kyofu. Now, the, the reason for this is this was a phrase that was a traditional Japanese psychiatric term for um, this particular manifestation of OCD. And the reason they didn't want to continue using that phrase is because it sort of implied that only people in Japanese culture can meet this diagnostic criteria. That's not the case, even though they use a traditional Japanese word. Um, so they dropped it, and now they just call it olfactory reference disorder. Example three of other specified bipolar and related disorder, because remember when you do an other specified diagnosis, the DSM will list examples of what could be a situation where somebody gets the other specified label. An example number three for um, other specified bipolar the line that reads, if this occurs in an individual with an established diagnosis of persistent depressive disorder or dysthymia, both diagnoses can be concurrently applied during the periods when the full criteria for hypomanic episode are met has been deleted. And that's because of a conflict with criterion E of persistent depressive disorder, which states that there's never been a manic episode or a hypomanic episode. So this was obviously a contradiction that the work groups caught on to and remedied in the DSM-5 TR. Manic episode superimposed on a psychotic disorder has been added as an example five of other specified bipolar and related disorder. It's used when other psychotic disorders from the exclusion criterion for bipolar one and two, like schizophrenia, delusional disorder, and psychotic disorder NOS, do not have mood episodes as part of their diagnostic criteria. So there's no way for the mood episodes to be accounted for by the diagnosis. So some of these are tedious but we'll get through these and we'll get onto some other stuff, including our new disorder. Other specified delirium, uh, the DSM-5 example of attenuated delirium syndrome has been replaced with the phrase sub-syndromal delirium, which is a phrase that is more common in the international um, psychiatric community. Other specified depressive disorder, uh, major depressive episode superimposed has been added as example four. And you use that when a major depressive episode occurs concurrent with a psychotic disorder that does not have mood episodes as a part of its diagnostic criteria. Other specified feeding or eating disorder, atypical anorexia nervosa. The sentence, individuals with atypical anorexia nervosa may experience many of the physiological complications associated with anorexia um, has been added to the description of the atypical anorexia nervous example to clarify the presence of physiological consequences during presentation does not mean that the diagnosis is the typical anorexia nervosa. Other specified schizophrenia, spectrum and other psychotic disorder. Oh, I dropped the example number. I need to get that back into this slide. But in one of the examples, there's a phrase, delusional symptoms in partner of individual with delusional disorder. And that was changed to delusional symptoms in the context of relationship with an individual with prominent delusions. And that's because they wanna make it clear that the inducer, which is the person who sort of induces the delusion in the other person, does not necessarily have to be in a romantic relationship with the individual. They could just have a relationship of whatever kind with that individual. And remember how I said earlier that when you see in parentheses something next to a disorder, it kind of means we're transitioning from using one phrase to another, but we wanna make it an easier transition. Well, and remember in the DSM-5, well, in the DSM-4, we had dysthymic disorder. And in the DSM-5, we took dysthymic disorder and major depressive disorder chronic, and we smushed them together and then created a spectrum of severity. But we still said in parentheses, dysthymia next to persistent depressive disorder. So people could track that this included what we used to call dysthymia. Well, now they've dropped it. Um, and that's not only to keep the term updated, but it's also to avoid confusion. Because remember, dysthymia and DSM-4 was a milder presentation than major depressive disorder chronic. So they didn't want people to think this is like depression light necessarily. 
um, and keeping dysthymia in the parentheses would feed that idea. All specifiers was removed except anxious distress and a typical feature. Those are the only remaining specifiers that you can tack on at the end of that diagnosis. For PTSD, the note stating witnessing does not include events that are witnessed only in electronic media, television, media, movie, or pictures in Criterion A2 has been removed. It's redundant because Criterion A2 already indicates that events occurring to others must be witnessed in person. I think we actually mentioned that on the previous slide dealing with diagnoses for children. Social anxiety disorder, remember the parentheses thing again? We had social phobia in parentheses next to social anxiety disorder in DSM-5 because we were transitioning away from using the old DSM-4 label of social phobia. But now we dropped it all together. They feel like people should have made the transition already. It's now just social anxiety disorder. For substance and medication induced bipolar and related disorder, um, for criterion A in the DSM-5, we have the verbiage prominent and persistent disturbance in mood that predominates in the clinical picture and is characterized by elevated, expansive, irritable mood with or without depressed mood. And that has been changed to say is characterized by abnormally elevated, expansive, or irritable mood and abnormally increased activity or energy. This was done to make it clearer that we are not talking about a substance-induced depressive disorder. We're talking about a bipolar disorder. Because remember in the DSM-4, we mood disorders included both bipolar and depression under that umbrella. And then we got rid of that in the DSM-5, but we accidentally left a few remnants in from before that change. And this is, I think, a, an attempt to remedy that. DSM-5 criterion B1 verbiage developed during or soon after substance intoxication or withdrawal at or after exposure to medication has been updated to say exposure to or withdrawal from a medication and that's just to denote that um, sometimes th this phenomenon can manifest after the medication use has stopped, uh, the person is no longer being exposed to it, but they are still in withdrawal. So hopefully that makes sense. Suicidal behavior and non-suicidal self-injury diagnosis codes have been added to those two things. So those two things, they existed in section three of the DSM-5, as possible disorders that will be adopted in the future. Now they have not been adopted. So here's, here's the weird thing. They are now diagnoses, but they are not disorders. So those of you who've seen my Z code presentation, you know about this. In the final chapter of section two of the DSM, there is a chapter called other conditions that may be a focus of clinical attention. And that chapter includes a whole bunch of diagnoses that are not actually mental disorders. Like for example, malingering or parent-child relational problem or um, other problems related to legal circumstances. Uh, those are all Z codes in that case. And they're all in that chapter, they're diagnoses. But now we've added to that chapter, actual diagnostic codes for suicidal behavior and non-suicidal self-injury. So that if you have a client so they are exhibiting suicidal behavior or non-suicidal self-injury, but they do not meet criteria for say like a depressive disorder, for example, then you can code that circumstance and you can make it a diagnosis, but you're not calling it a disorder necessarily. And this will make it easier to track prevalence rates, they think, and to have a better way to communicate cross-culturally what it is that we're talking about, to have a code assigned to it. Unspecified mood disorder has been added, and you will see it appear in both the depressive and bipolar chapters of the DSM-5 TR. And the reason is there are some scenarios, so we do have, remember, mood disorders in DSM-4 included bipolar and depressive disorders. In DSM-5, we split them into two separate things, the bipolar disorder chapter and the depressive disorder chapter. And there's a reason for that, by the way, that's informed by neurobiological research, but we won't get into that tangent right now. Um, so that got rid of things like an unspecified mood disorder, but now they've added it back in because they realize that sometimes somebody has symptoms that are characteristic of one or the other disorder, but it's difficult to really choose between whether it should be an unspecified depressive or an unspecified bipolar disorder. So they've just added the new unspecified mood disorder, um, to both of those chapters. Um, so I'm going to give you a case example now, and um, 
This is a real case with some information that has been altered to protect identity. Francesca is a 54-year-old married female. Her son completed suicide more than two years ago. She often feels depressed, but she does not think that she feels depressed most of the time and is unsure whether she feels depressed most of the day. Her appetite's normal, she sleeps well, but she often experiences fatigue and anhedonia, diminished interest or pleasure in activities that she'd normally enjoy. She experiences recurrent involuntary and distressing dreams and memories associated with her son's suicide. She used to avoid places and things that reminded her of her son outside the home rather than inside the home, but this is no longer the case. Her beliefs about life and the world have become more negative and pessimistic, and she struggles with substantial guilt associated with her son's suicide. She ruminates frequently on questions related to what she missed, where she went wrong, what her son was thinking and feeling before he completed suicide, etc. She's invested a great deal of time and effort in investigating to try to find some answer or explanation for a suicide. She's not particularly angry or hypervigilant, and she doesn't engage in reckless or self-destructive behaviors. She thinks about her son very frequently and longs for him daily. Since her son's death, she feels as though a part of herself has died, has struggled to engage with friends or pursue hobbies or interests, experiences life as meaningless, feels intensely lonely, and feels emotionally numb. So the question I have for you, what do you think would be a possible diagnosis for Francisca? You can enter your response into the chat box or you can ask to be unmuted so that you can speak directly to us. So one person says, persistent depressive disorder. One person says major depressive disorder. One person says PTSD. Um, somebody else, I'm not gonna say what they said because um, we'll come back to it. Reactive depression or unresolved grief reaction. Persistent depressive disorder. So what some of you are doing is you are saying prolonged grief disorder, which was not in the DSM-5. Um, you could argue it kind of was in the DSM-5 under a slightly different name, but um, it is our new disorder in the DSM-5-TR, prolonged grief disorder. Now, here's the reason that I put this case example in. In my opinion, this client does not meet criteria for major depressive disorder. Um, why not? Well, because she does not feel depressed most of the time, and she doesn't even think she feels depressed most of the day, which, by the way, is required for persistent depressive disorder as well. So she kind of seems to sh be shy of meeting the criteria for a depressive disorder, unless you did other specified depressive disorder or something. And some people say PTSD, except there is one component of PTSD that she's missing. Um, because I said she used to avoid places and things that reminded her of her son, but this is no longer the case. In year one, she did, but in year two, she doesn't. And that's actually a required criterion for a PTSD diagnosis. So she doesn't meet criteria for PTSD. She just narrowly misses it. She just narrowly misses criteria for a depressive disorder. Um, and uncomplicated bereavement, well, we're two years later and she's experiencing clinically significant impairment or distress. Um, so I don't know if we would just say, oh, this is just normal grief. Now, like her spouse, for example, is not experiencing what she's experiencing and is functioning very differently. And I'm not saying that it's not normal for us to grieve differently, but you could make a case, maybe she doesn't have a disorder and this is just normal and healthy, but most people two years after are not experiencing the level of impairment or distress that she's experiencing, and she wants and needs help. And as you know, uh, if there's no diagnosis, then there's no coverage for that help. But it raises all kinds of interesting questions. Does she have a disorder? Or does she not? Well, I have, I have also had people in other webinars say, maybe she's got OCD, 
because she's ruminating on obsessive thoughts. There must be something I'm missing. There must be something I'm missing. I must find it. I have to do this. I have to do this. And she feels compelled to invest tremendous time and effort and things that won't bring her any kind of helpful outcome. And she knows that. Um, but, and they say that's kind of OCD like. So I've gotten all kinds of opinions from people, but the mere fact that so many people give us so many different labels for this case example, maybe this actually does give you a good example of why, what the reasoning is for this new disorder being added. I get that there are people who say this new disorder pathologizes grief. Um, I think there's validity to that perspective. I think there's validity to the perspective that it should be a disorder also. I think they're both valid arguments. But for this client, she doesn't seem to fit anywhere else. But if you look at the criteria for the new diagnosis, she seems to fit it spot on. There are a small subset of people, um, a small percentage of people who experience grief in a pattern that looks very much like this even a long time after they've lost their loved one. And um, I think these are the kinds of cases, this is a real case, these are the kinds of cases for which this new disorder has been created. Now, this is the only new disorder in the DSM-5-TR. And one thing, I don't think I have it in one of the clips that I offered in this slideshow, but one thing that Dr. First talks about in the interview that you've seen bits and pieces of is that they are very hesitant to add a new disorder to the DSM. Very hesitant. It takes a lot for them to add one. And the reason is they recognize it's really easy to add something, but once it's added, it's really hard to take it away. Part of why it's hard to take it away is that usually some kind of community he sort of develops around that diagnosis. And people are getting help through insurance, for example, around that diagnosis. And when you take that diagnosis away, there's a public outcry from specialists who start specializing in that thing, um, who work in the field, from people, communities of clients who have evolved around the identity of that disorder, and from people who might be losing coverage for care connected to that disorder. So they're very hesitant to add new things, but this one they added for better or for worse, right? Oh my goodness. I really wish I would have launched this polling question before um, I just gave you that big long diatribe um, because it would have been neat to see what you all would have come up with on this. So I guess I'll have to save that for the next group um, that I do this training with. Um, which I think is like next month or something. Because these are the disorders that I've had people give me for this case. Now, I've never, you guys are the first ones I've given the DSM-5 TR update to. This is the first group. But in a different um, training, I used that same case example for tricky diagnoses. And these are all the different things that people have given me as a diagnosis for Francesca. But now... I imagine most people would say that the diagnosis is um, the new prolonged grief disorder once they learn about that disorder. So in 2013, we get persistent complex bereavement disorder added to section three, which are conditions that are going to be researched. 2018, we get this proposal submitted to include the category in the main text of the manual, and that triggers a review by the DSM Steering Committee and the Review Committee on Internalizing Disorders. In June 2019, a workshop held to develop consensus around the appropriate criteria for the diagnosis based on the latest research. And then in late 2019, that criteria is finalized and approved by the DSM Steering Committee, posted for public comment, approved by the Steering Committee, and then I got the Steering Committee on there twice, then by APA's Assembly and Board of Trustees. And then finally, last month, um, there it is, published, to, and added to trauma and stress-related disorders chapter. So it's in the same chapter as adjustment disorder, and it's in the same chapter as PTSD and acute stress disorder and um, all those things, reactive attachment disorder. Now, what does it actually look like? We'll get to that in a moment, but it is defined generally as an intense yearning or longing for the deceased, often with intense sorrow and emotional pain and a preoccupation with thoughts or memories of the deceased in children and adolescents, that preoccupation can focus on circumstances of the death itself. The prevalence is unknown. They say that in the DSM-5-TR. There are some kind of pooled meta-analyses that would suggest that 
the prevalence is 9.8%. But the weird thing when you read that part in the manual is they don't say if that's a lifetime prevalence or what do they mean it's 9.8%. Are they saying it's 9.8% of people who have lost somebody? Are they saying 9.8% of people will have this condition at some point in their lives? I don't know. They don't, they just don't give you that detail, which I thought was very odd. Uh, so still trying to figure out what the prevalence is, but it certainly seems to be a minority of people who are grieving a lost one. And then one of the arguments made for this being a legitimate diagnosis is that people with this disorder that meet the criteria for this new disorder, they respond to a targeted therapy. Um, and that targeted therapy, I think they used to call it prolonged grief treatment. And so when you're looking Examining research on it from like 2013 to 2018, I think you'll see it named that way. I think they changed it to prolonged grief disorder therapy. Um, when it was learned that the DSM 5TR would include prolonged grief disorder and that that would be the verbiage used. Now, the interesting thing is in like one study, for example, the response rate for people who had lost a loved one and met the criteria for this disorder the response rate for people who did this therapy versus a typical grief theory, which is grief-focused interpersonal psychotherapy, it was a tremendous difference in terms of response rate. 70.5% of people with prolonged grief disorder responded to PGDT, and only 32% of them responded to grief-focused interpersonal psychotherapy. And in another study, the response rate was 82.5%. And placebo, of course, was like 55%. So what we're seeing is that maybe a case is being made that this should be a disorder because there's a targeted therapy that works better for them than your standard grief therapies that work well for people who do not have this disorder but are grieving. That's part of their logic anyway. So what does the actual diagnostic criteria look like? Well, first you have the death at least 12 months ago of a person who was close to the bereaved individual. And for children and adolescents, it'd be at least six months ago. So if they're, if in Francesca's case, she was two years out. So she obviously met the 12 months ago um, criterion. Since the death, the development of a persistent grief response characterized by one or both of the following symptoms have been present most days to a clinically significant degree. In addition, those symptoms have occurred for nearly every day for at least the last month. So the first is an intense yearning and longing for the deceased person. It's not just a yearning and longing. Who doesn't yearn for and long for their dead loved one? But it's intense, which of course is a subjective term. Second, preoccupation with thoughts or memories of the deceased person. In children and adolescents, this preoccupation can focus on the circumstances of the death. We mentioned that earlier. And then C, since the death, at least three of these things have been present most days, again, to a clinically significant degree. And in addition, those symptoms have occurred nearly every day for at least the last month. So it can be at least three of these eight things. Number one, identity disruption. Remember, Francesca met that one. Number two, marked sense of disbelief about the death. Francesca did not meet that one. She did not have an intense disbelief about her son's death. But some people do. Number three, avoidance of reminders that the person's dead. Francesca did not experience this one. She did earlier on in her grief process, but two years out, she's not experiencing it anymore. Intense emotional pain, such as anger, bitterness, or sorrow related to the death. Difficulty reintegrating into one's relationship and activities after the death. Examples are problems engaging with friends, pursuing interests, or planning for the future. Francesca is definitely meeting this one. This one is very strong for her. In fact, we are two years out and um, she just participated in her first interaction with a friend in two years. Number six, emotional numbness, absence or marked reduction of emotional experience as a result of the death, which again is one that Francesca um, endorsed in the case scenario a few slides ago. Number seven, feeling that life is meaningless as a result of the death, which Francesca endorsed. Then finally, intense loneliness, as a result of the death, which Francesca also endorsed. She doesn't meet the criteria, 
for a major depressive episode, when you go down it line by line, even though she has some strongly depressive symptoms, but she does seem to pretty clearly meet these criterion. And then we've got our usual things that we tack on at the end of most disorders. The disturbance has to cause clinically significant distress or impairment in social occupation or other important areas of functioning. You can have symptoms all day long, but unless those symptoms are creating a you know, clinically significant impairment or distress, you don't have a disorder. The duration and severity of the bereavement reaction clearly exceeded expected social, cultural, or religious norms. So here we also are factoring in what is culturally normative for this individual. And then finally, because and I'll, I'll just say, it, for, there are some cultures that encourage a more prolonged grief experience um, by their practices, traditions, and customs compared to other cultures. And finally, the symptoms are not better explained by another mental disorder, such as major depressive or PTSD. Remember, those were ruled out in Francesca's case because she didn't meet the full criteria for either. And nor for, nor are they substance induced, being connected to medication or alcohol or to another medical condition, maybe a brain disorder of some kind connected to a brain injury better explains these symptoms, who knows? So before we move on to these section three changes, yeah, we're doing good on time. This is not bad. I'm gonna hit the chat box, see what we can see here. Since the last time I looked at the chat box, we're about to answer John's question about cross-cutting tools. Um, so about that above comment that dealt with um, people with, within the autistic community who are self-diagnosing, she says, I agree 100% that a diagnosis is ideal, but groups that get overlooked and misdiagnosed often start out with self-diagnosis to start their journey toward a formal diagnosis. That makes a lot of sense to me. The criteria for ASD was modeled like many on white males. So women and people of color are underdiagnosed due to their ability to mask. Okay, uh, that is really interesting. I actually, to be honest with you, was unaware that the symptoms of autism spectrum disorder were based on white males and that perhaps maybe the disorder itself manifest differently among women um, or among people of color. And I would love to learn more about that. So thank you for adding that to the conversation. Uh, let's see what else we got. Uh, some stuff about CEs and some business things. We got your comments about which diagnosis Francesca had. We had lots of opinions about that. I hope we discuss the poor validity and reliability of DSM diagnoses within the clinical setting, which is reflected in the diversity of diagnoses listed above. Okay, that's a good point, Thomas. Um, I did not include slides about that. I probably should add slides about that. I know when I did the DSM-5 training, especially the long version where I had like six to eight hours, oh, I talked a lot about that then. But I will say a few things about it right now. Um, the DSM is a flawed diagnostic system, in my humble opinion. Uh, there are lots of, there are just all kind. there are so many legitimate criticisms of the DSM system. And I think you're right. There are problems with reliability. Um, hence, Francesca just got a million different labels from different people. Um, but a, a counter argument is that with the invention of the DSM-3, the reliability increased substantially for the DSM, starting with the DSM-3 on. And it has been increasing. It's been getting better, but it's still a flawed and imperfect system. And it also raises deep fundamental and philosophical questions about whether some things that we call disorders really ought to be thought of as disorders and whether the medical model is really the best way to conceptualize what's happening with people. So my primary uh, professional identity is as a counselor. And traditionally, one of the differences between counselors and some of our colleagues in psychology, who we sort of branched off from, if you go back far enough in history, um, is that we tend to be more likely to prefer conceptualizing human problems, uh, not necessarily as being pathology related or disorder related and to view things through a more of a contextual lens that could be developmental in nature or social or spiritual in nature or ecological or environmental in nature for that matter. 
And I think the DSM makes efforts to do that, but it's still a medical model that is a pathology oriented model. And it's also something that counselors are expected to know how to use and to do with diligence. And the reality is in the system, I will be honest with you. I do not, I don't have anything better than the DSM to offer. I don't think anybody else does have anything better than the DSM to offer. I think it's the best system we have in spite of its inherent flaws. And I look forward to the day, someday in the future, when we have something much better than the DSM. And I know like the, like, um, the National Institutes of Mental Health have been working on some kind of different system, but theirs is more biology oriented than the DSM from what I understand. So, so many valid criticisms and controversies about the DSM in general. And I probably should in future versions of this brief, uh, this brief overview add at least something about that. Um, so thank you for raising that point, Thomas. And if you have more to contribute about that topic, please feel free to throw it into the chat box. Two, avoidance and hypervigilance are missing. Um, Kelly says, I think she's talking about the PTSD, um, whether Francisca met the criteria for PTSD. Does this diagnosis have to be related to death? I'm very excited about this new diagnosis since I have many clients that present similarly. Well, I think if we go back to the very beginning, the death of at least 12 months ago. So yes, it has to be related to death. It looks like to me. Absolutely. Linda says, uh, how and about exactly what does she feel guilty related to her son's suicide? That's what a therapist should be working on. How does she feel? She failed him or wasn't there for him. She needs to forgive herself. Uh, that has been two years of work on doing that. And Francesca has come a long way. Um, certainly has come a long way in forgiving herself and isn't there yet at the same time. Could this apply to divorce? Someone grieving their divorce for 10 years? Again, because it literally says death in the diagnostic criteria, I don't think it could apply to something like, like divorce. What is the diagnosis? I missed it. Never mind, LOL. Okay, great. Um, please define complicated bereavement. Well, I think um, when I hear you say complicated bereavement, I think of that complex grief which we saw in section three of the DSM-5, which became prolonged grief disorder in the DSM-5-TR. So I'm, th I'm thinking of that phrase as being about this diagnosis, this particular disorder, but maybe somebody has a better definition for complicated bereavement. Was the disorder born out of pandemic-related death and grief, or was it already in the works as a diagnosis? So given that if we go back to the timeline, I think it was 2018, that people first started, let's see if we go back to this timeline. 2013 is when its precursor got introduced. That was before the pandemic. 2018 is when the formal proposal to make it a diagnosis was issued. That was before the pandemic. So this is a pre-pandemic um, research-based disorder. Now, what a lot of people have said is with the pandemic, the pressure to have this diagnosis has increased but, and that the relevance of it may be to society's increased, but it started before the pandemic. Uh, the definition of the handout states in turn, intense yearning or longing for the deceased. But I guess you could say divorce is the death of a marriage or a relationship. But yeah, I think we're getting a little metaphorical though. And I think that I would assume that the AP intended death to mean, you know, to be more literally mean the death of a person, especially given, um, the death of a person who was close to the bereaved individual. So I think it'd be hard to make the case that we're talking about divorce here or some other thing that somebody could grieve. What is compounded grief? Ooh, good question. I don't know. If anybody else knows, um, please chime in. And the differences between complicated bereavement versus uncomplicated bereavement. Okay. So I, th I think very simply put, um, Linda, is that uncomplicated bereavement is supposed to be normal, healthy grief. That's a Z code in DSM-5, and you'll find it again in the final chapter of section two of the DSM-5 in the Z code chapter. So it's normal healthy grief is a way to think of it. And I get that that word normal, I'm using it awfully casually when we know that 
There's a wide range of what is normal and healthy for grief. And there's even some subjectivity on what is normal and healthy. Whereas complicated bereavement is when we're saying that this is not normal, healthy grief. This is a person who quite a long time later has, has not gotten back to living life. I think that would probably be the most succinct way I could word my understanding of the difference. But uh, Linda's added compounded grief is when there are two or more deaths within a short amount of time. Okay, thank you for telling us that because I did not know. So that might answer um, Kay's question. Okay, so I think, uh, oh, let me look at the Q&A box also. You referred to the DSM-11, which the U.S. has not been recognized, or which the U.S. has not recognized. What additional information, if any, is contained therein? So it's actually not the DSM-11, it's the ICD-11. And um, there's like a whole other, uh, there's probably a whole other um, training that we could do on what's, what's in the ICD-11. And I don't know a lot of the answers to that, but I would assume it will include coding changes. And then what will happen when ICD-11 gets implemented is the APA will decide any changes in coding in the ICD-11, how do they change any of the codes that are listed in the DSM? Because remember that the DSM uses ICD codes. And then John says, are dissociative features common to prolonged grief disorder? Oh, that's a good question. Now, we don't see it listed here as a symptom. That, that doesn't mean that a person couldn't experience it. And in fact, if I open up my shiny glistening copy of the DSM-5TR, it would be interesting if I could figure out whether, um, whether in the course and prognosis section, rather than the diagnostic criteria, if it says anything at all about, um, about dissociative symptoms connected to prolonged grief disorder. Uh, let me just spend a quick moment reading that and seeing if it says anything about dissociation in the diagnostic features section. Um, Associated features, let's look there and see if it says anything about dissociation. It does, and it does say hallucinations can be experienced. Um, and other associated features that aren't part of the diagnostic criteria can include bitterness, anger, or restlessness, blaming others for the death, and decreased sleep quantity and quality. Um, but it does say hallucinations happen sometimes as well as comorbid depression and anxiety, social identity disruption, increased healthcare visits, and somatic symptoms such as changes in appetite. And there can be harmful health behaviors that, that somebody engages in while they're grieving. It does not mention it doesn't mention dissociative symptoms in the associated features section either. So I don't believe there's anything in the DSM about that. I wonder in the culture related diagnostic issues section if it says anything about it. So I'm just gonna say for now, I don't know, but it would be interesting if there's somebody who's an expert on this new disorder, or if we looked at the professional literature on it, if we saw any evidence of that. And next we have, do you recommend counselors have the ICD manuals like we have the DSM manuals? So yes and no. Um, I do actually like to use the ICD-10 in my practice. And the way I use it is twofold. Number one, if I get medical records on a client I'm working with and those medical, and there are medical diagnoses that I can't make because they're outside of my expertise, but they are relevant to the work I'm doing with the client, then I add them in my diagnosis list um, and that includes ICD-10 codes that are not going to be in the DSM, obviously. Second, if um, when I'm coding Z codes, there are some Z codes that are in the ICD-10 that are not in the DSM-5. And so I find it very helpful to, um, to access the ICD-10 when I'm doing that. An example of an ICD-10 code 
that you won't see in the DSM-5 is there's a code for family history of, I think, mental illness. And that's relevant for me to remember sometimes that somebody comes from a, history, a family system where there's a lot of mental illness. And so I like to put it on my diagnosis list, but it's not a disorder. And that ICD-10 code is not in the DSM-5. Now, having said that, I don't think you need to buy an ICD-10 because anything you want from the ICD-10, you can get for free online. So just go to icd10data.com or literally do a Google search, ICD-10 code for family history of mental illness. And it will show you in a simple Google search. You don't actually need to buy anything to get those codes. Uh, okay. Thank you, Linda. Linda said, I, I appreciate you wrote something. Or I wrote you something about Francisca. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm also going to go back to the chat box here, and then I'm going to just make sure there's not a couple other slides that we need to get to first. Um, do you think we need to go out and purchase a DSM-5 tier if we have the five? Well, uh, that's a good question. I would say if you want to A, diagnose prolonged grief disorder and or you wanted that extra information about it that you don't see in the diagnostic criteria, you'd probably want to buy it. And also, if you think any of those other little nuances that I went through in these slides will impact your diagnostic process, then you should probably get it. Or if you want the updated statistical information about prevalence and about the way that the considerations involving um, different cultures and cultural considerations, if you want any of that stuff, you should probably get the new edition. If you don't care about any of that stuff I just listed, then you probably wouldn't particularly need to get one. Uh, now I might come back to some other questions in a moment, but I, I also wanted to get to John's question from earlier and make sure we cover these section three changes real quick. Um, the male and female checkboxes were removed from the DSM-5 assessment measures. So John asked about cross-cutting symptom measures and they have removed those checkboxes from those measures to sort of, again, step outside of the, the binary male and female classifications. Nothing else to my knowledge has changed in any of those measures because none of the changes we've talked about really affect those measures. And as far as I'm aware, they did not add a screening question in cross-cutting symptom measure level one for prolonged grief disorder. So I don't think you'll see anything else different there. But you will see um, the clinician rated dimensions of psychosis symptom severity measure. They changed the instructions for that measure. Uh, so that's an exception to add those severity specifiers that we talked about earlier. And in the WHODAS 2.0, they added instructions on how to calculate the summary scores for WHODAS 2.0. So some of you have no idea what we're talking about with these. You can watch my YouTube video um, how to use free online assessment measures and learn all about this stuff that you see in section three. And the cultural formulation interview, or you can go to mbfe.net and you can take our on-demand webinar on entitled how to use free online assessment measures or something like that. The clinical formulation interview, which I love, they changed the terms in that measure to include culture, race, and ethnicity um, term revisions. And that's about it for those, those things. So getting back to our questions here, because we have just a few minutes to continue working through some of those. How does the identity disturbance in prolonged grief disorder differ from depersonalization? Well, a short version of that, I would say, is that the, depers the um, identity disturbance that you see in PGD, it may not be like, that feeling or sensation like I'm not real. Um, people who have experienced it know what I'm talking about. But it's this weird sensation, sort of, where a person feels like they don't really exist. Or maybe there's some bystander and they're just observing all of this happening around them, but they're not really them. That's a little different from, I feel like I don't know who I am or what I want out of life or what my goals are or aspirations or what I like and don't like anymore. But, oh, I know I'm me. I just don't really know who me is. That's different than I don't feel like I'm, re I really exist. Like I'm really here. There are two different concepts. I don't know if I describe them very clearly or not. Um, Stacy says, what was the YouTube video? So go to youtube.com uh, slash Aaron Norton. I'll type this in the chat box. And then, um, 
and the, the video I think is called how to use free online assessment measures or something like that. Or you can go to nbfe.net and click on training and then on-demand webinars and register for that same training. The difference is if you watch it on YouTube, you don't get CEs. If you go through nbfe.net and you register for it and then watch the video and answer the questions, you can get a CE certificate, but there is a small fee for it. It's not very much. Um, what else do we got here? I know that Linda offered a comment about Francisca. So what's Francisca's investment in staying sad and anhedonic and in her continuing grieving? What's the secondary gain? She can play the sympathy, sympathy card with people and it's her excuse to be inactive, feel sorry for herself and not live her life and or guilt trip herself. Uh, that could be, you know, certainly it's helpful to examine what function does it serve, but also she could be a person who was very ruminative and kind of obsessive compulsive before the death that created a predisposing variable and factor. And she could have been fused with the person who died and all kinds of other relevant ways to, to conceptualize what's going on in the case. Um, in addition to some kind of gain that comes from being in the role of griever. Um, for example, she seems completely uninterested in any attention whatsoever from people about this. And she's still working and believes very strongly in work ethic even though she's not functioning, she's more of an suffering within herself person than I'm trying to get something from outside of me person, if that makes sense. So let's see, uh, we got lots of compliments for how fabulous Valentino is. So I hope that this has been helpful for you all. And uh, we very much will look forward to seeing you at future MBFE training events. And hopefully you at least got your overview, your, your introduction to the DSM-5 TR. And I wish you all a very meaningful and hopefully refreshing and rejuvenating, rejuvenating weekend. We'll see you next time.